All right, guys, Melissa again. Hey, I've got three videos coming up. This video may come before or after, not sure. So I've got a little eyeliner. Don't worry about that. Okay, guys, sometimes my eyeliner just like smudges. Um, so I want to talk about some things. So these three videos, I talked about how <clears throat> in two years, there has been a lot of storms in my life with my husband. I mean, we lost a home and then I talk about like a whole list of stuff that had happened in two years, basically. Now that doesn't even compare to like the first few years of my life. And, you know, up until I can remember with all the chaos, with all my family members, everything. I mean, I'm used to a lot of chaos, right? Living life hard, boom, 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 you know, one thing after another, right? A lot of people do that. They live life hard. So when I had my kids, I was like, okay, I am going to slow down, especially when I stayed home, which was really difficult for me because I am so used to all the energy I have of go, go, go. And I did do a lot. I mean, I had Bible studies and I had them in, you know, swim lessons and sports through the city of Concord and sports through the church and all this stuff and Boy Scouts and camping. I mean, I was still pretty busy all the way up. Um, but I mean, I think it was a little slower than the usual pace. So, you know, my teenage years, absolutely crazy. I didn't even get into like stuff going on completely with my family during the teen years. Um, I had a graduation party, you know, and I didn't talk about like who was there, Valerie and Tom and Michelle and Steve and um, <clears throat> Judy and Ronnie Muse and all these people, right? So we had all these people from the bow and arrow shoot, Sissa, uh, the Pickens, Sissa and Kenny, Mark, Matt, just Cindy, the McCars, tons of people, right? When I used when we used to do the bow and arrow shoots, many times we would go over to the Macars, my cousins, over in Deerfield, Mount Delight Road. This is like where all my relatives live. Uh, well, my dad's side, all the relatives live there. Linda and Dave, Mann, Elsie, and um, uh, Hannah Macar, um, geez, Phyllis and John Scribner, the Scribners, the Martells. Uh, then I went up the road further uh, with my relatives, and there were some people I never even met. Um, then I think it was, was it Crystal Lake in Deerfield? Yeah, family reunions, on and on, just tons of people, guys. And when you live like that, you are used to boom, 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 you know, next, next activity, next activity, right? So, I mean, some of us, I mean, I've had extremely busy life, uh, extremely busy life, up until like recently, things have really slowed down for me. And, um, you know, it's okay because I'm doing a lot of deep work and I'm getting ready to get out there again and help a lot of people with um, abortion care. <clears throat> so trauma is different though. I mean, you can go through all the craziness and all the busyness and your crazy aunts who bring you over like cake with, made from like... Uh, sugar-free, you know, cake and, you know, ugly gifts. You can go through like a lot of stuff, okay? But trauma is different. So today I was on the phone with someone talking about the resources to get my business going online. So I already had someone call me about some Airbnbs. Um, so that's one thing, Airbnbs, cleaning. That's one business I'm getting going. And then with my book and online business, and then from there, after I get that out, or while I'm getting that out, I'll probably do some videos here on trauma as I go through the council. <clears throat> so today I have an appointment uh, with my son to go to the dentist. I'm actually like finding myself being like, Melissa, you are actually trying to avoid the dentist. You are actually making all these excuses why you can't go. So I'm like, Melissa, just be thankful you know, you're getting this with Medicaid, you're getting it for free, go to the dentist, right? So next week I have a doctor's appointment. And from there with the Medicaid, I have the primary care, which will give me the referrals. And, you know, I can't work a whole lot right now if I want all the medical care, right? So um, <laughs> as I'm doing this, I'm like, okay, get some videos online about the trauma. And that's what I will be talking about. So to start off, 
as I'm going to be doing courses and curriculum will be my dream life, making curriculum to help other women heal from abortion. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about is the nervous system. The nervous system we have, everybody's into, everybody has a nervous system that's completely individual, like a fingerprint. So one of the things I remember as I was listening to a video yesterday, and I'll do a lot of this from scratch, from stuff I pick up from videos, the counseling, I should be starting that. I would think probably by next week, once I get that going, the week after the doctor's appointment, um, that's all going to be free with Medicaid. So I have two counselors to choose from. One's a Christian that I know of. I probably will go with her because we're going to be on the same page more. But the thing with the nervous system, <clears throat> Christian or not, is your body can only take so much, right? You only can take so much. And um, when you heal, it's like peeling an onion back. And you've gotten through this layer. You've gotten through this layer. And I feel like I'm finally at the pinnacle. I feel like I'm finally at the, you know, part that needed to be really healed. So, um, <clears throat> the trauma part, which we don't talk about that enough with abortion, um, is the trauma that took place. You know, it's not just an abortion. For some women it is. For others, it is trauma, especially forced abortions, especially when you don't know what you're going in for. You don't even know. You're just like, okay, you're an obedient kid and you're going to trust your mom and you're going to trust the adults and be like, okay, you know, I'm going to trust the doctor and do what the doctor says. You're a kid. You're a minor. I mean, when I was brought up, you didn't have much of a voice. And back in those days, kids were seen and not heard. So then all of a sudden you get in there, right? And something's being put in your body and you're thinking, okay, I'm done. You know, I don't know what they're doing, but I'm done. And lo and behold, no, you're not done. This is just the beginning of something that's going to scar you for life. So, you know, being told you can even leave and come back, it's like nobody explaining, like, what are we doing, right? And thinking of going to the dentist today, you're usually told, okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is, you know, let me show you your x-rays, etc. But abortion, not my abortion, not back in the day, it's come over here, boom, come over here, boom, you know? And so <clears throat> when I was listening to a video, I was thinking about just the shock of the drama around me. So, you know, just being like, okay, phew, I'm finally over the shock of the condom breaking. Like this guy was a jerk, you know, we're done. I'm doing what I want now. And then... You know, to be like, okay, you know, the condom broke. He, he could have got me pregnant. You know, back then you think you're invincible. And then to have somebody like my mother, you know, who usually dragged me around everywhere. Come on, Melissa. We're not, come on, let's leave the dance, whatever. Rough, just rough, right? Then to have her pretty, it was usually pretty indirect, but directly now to change and kind of attack me. <clears throat> With the cruel words, right? You know, don't tell me you're pregnant. You know, that's kind of how it was. And they say a lot of body language is not even verbal. It's the body language before someone says something, right? So, I mean, I'm trying to remember, like, her rough mannerism and how that was presented. And, you know, one of the symptoms of trauma is you freeze. You just freeze. And I've always talked about having that deer in headlight kind of look like you just totally freeze everything slows down and those words are in your head going over and over and you're trying to process what this means right and meanwhile like everything around you just slows down I remember being in the kitchen my father you know built the house with his own two hands and I just remember everything looking different now. It's like my whole identity changed. I was no longer the, you know, the favored, favored, you know, granddaughter or the favored um, cool girl. It was now you are in big trouble and just trying to process that. So that is where the trauma started for me. It wasn't even the condom breaking. Yeah, that was... 
that was surprising and I felt tricked and I was just like, you know, bring me home, you know, that kind of thing. But I dealt with that pretty well. And that was unexpected, right? That's something that may be traumatic for some people. For me, it was not. But at this point, when I already had gone through that alone and nobody knew about it except him, um, now I'm dealing with, you know, on top of that, now I'm dealing with this, right? So you want to get to the bottom and be like, how did that, how did that feel? How did that, what were you thinking? You know, what was the awareness? So you want to get to that. And before I could even process that, I mean, I was being slut shamed, basically, even though they knew I was with this guy and actually pushed it in many ways. Um, you know, it's now, you know, uh, my father, you know, giving me slut shaming looks, you know, and sending me to my room and another, you know, feeling of helplessness, total helplessness. And then just to go on and I think I had, you know, moved on and done other things and then to have, you know, my mother come in uh, after I, it, this all happened so quick too. That's why it's hard to process you know, to be like, okay, do you want me to help you raise the kid or what? You know, and that was not a sincere question. That was like, you know, what the heck are you asking exactly? And to be able to go back into that and be like, okay, so what did, what, how did I respond to that? And I know like I kind of ran, I, I, in my spirit, I just like ran. I was just like, you know, shook my head, like scared to death, scared to death of her attacking me like you know I was a kid and she's like you know just attacking me one thing after another and um I knew I did not want her help and then I figured after that I would figure it out somehow you know but from there she took me to the clinic and then that's a whole nother thing like I said when you're in the shock of you know we're going to put something in you you don't know I mean you have no idea you know, of what, what is going on medically, you know, nobody told you no real informed consent. So, um, we want to deal with it at that deeper root level ladies. And so as I go through this, I will be talking about, you know, that stuff that happened and how to, you know, feel it, what would have been a better response, what, you know, what you can do to ground yourself. Um, a lot of times when I would ground myself, I would count stairs. I, or I'd go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and I would ground myself during, you know, scary times. So <clears throat> when you're having a panic attack, which I had years later when I was dealing with this, I had to learn to breathe. And they say breathing is so important. Seriously, when I was um, in Webster on 127 New Hampshire Drive, this was after my first post-abortive class, a couple years after, and I felt like I could not breathe. I just, I, I was having a hard time breathing. I was having panic attacks. I had a friend who said, Melissa, just breathe. And I'd be like, hold on, hold on, you know, and I would just put the phone down and be like, okay, <clears throat> you know, and just concentrate and breathe. And that's without any help. That's without any, you know, really knowing except for a friend what to do and this is why you need other people around you guys and through this whole divorce storm too I've had other people be like Melissa you are awesome you are an amazing woman you are you know you are queen you are like an amazing woman so you when you have people who want to tear you down and drag you in the mud you want other people around you including the church who will deal with stuff with you you know I had one of the pastors say you want to mourn you know, your divorce. And shortly after that, I did. I'm like, okay, you know, I have mourned it. And um, it's just so weird that, you know, when you're trying to heal from abortion, all the shame, all the garbage you felt, you do have the enemy coming in and trying to shame you again through your own husband, right? So women will never forget when they needed their husband most. They needed him more than ever. And he left they will never forget that. So that that was a time in my life I had gone through another post-abortive class and my husband wasn't there for me. He wasn't there at all. And in one way, it was good because I needed to lean on the ladies more 
the first post-abortive class, they sent him a letter, a pregnancy center, for him to try to understand what I was going through. <clears throat> and he did share, lead me on for many years. He did. But that's, you know, that was okay with me. But for some women, it would not be okay to send, you know, the guy a letter. But, um, you know, so he, I had to lean on the woman more. I mean, I had him with the first post abortive class, but the second one I needed, I needed the woman more and I needed to express myself too in another way. And that was this channel. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to wrap this up because I got some things to do, but I'm going to be talking about healing from the deep rooted trauma and startling like the nervous system and how to get through that and how to get through other things and how to process. I mean, many times we live in the world where we cannot process. It's one thing on top of another, on another, on another. And before you know it, you're just like, okay, I'm going to have to take some extra time for myself, extra self-care and be able to process everything. And that's exactly what I've done without even knowing it. Like I've gone through the relationships with the boyfriends and been like, why would I, why would I date him? Why would I, you know, to be able to get through that and then to be like, okay, so why, you know, why, what happened here? And so there's a lot of times you don't have time to process stuff. So like, for example, I just went to, um, to our apartment office and said, Hey, you know, can, can we do, we're having an um, exterminator come over Friday because we have a hornet's nest over here. But we're having an exterminator come over Friday. Can we double up and can we get the dishwasher fixed too? And she says to me, the the guy who does pesticides doesn't fix dishwashers. And I just moved on and said, well, this is what's going on with the dishwasher. And I'm thinking after, did I not say that right? Did I, does it sound like I'm expecting an exterminator to, to do the dishwasher too? So, I mean, just take that one example of something so small like that and you're processing it and you're like, did I not say that the right way? To me, it makes sense. Did I come out and say that in a way that didn't make sense? So that's just a tiny little thing, right? But when you are living fast in the fast lane, you don't have time to process. So later on in life, you're like, okay, I need to process this. And this is what I mean with my video yesterday. To go up, you've got to go down. So as soon as I was dealing with some trauma stuff yesterday, the door opened up again with work. I had people get back to me. And it's like, yeah, Melissa, you're going to be even stronger now because you've gone through so much. When you do work and you start your business and you have these resources, you're going to be even stronger because you've had a break from all the chaos. You've slowed things down. These last two years, I didn't even know what God was doing. And he had me come over to Colorado without me knowing to get extra help for the abortion, to start a ministry, and to take extra good care of me. And let me tell you, God has been good. God has taken very good care of me. Doesn't even make sense on paper. There are times I didn't even have work and churches and people popped in and just took care of everything. So God is the one who provides. And I knew that before, but I'm thinking, yeah, but he provides with me working. And it's like, no, there's times that he provides for you even when you are not working. And you think it's you. And even looking back at how I've taken care of my kids, I was worrying the other night about one of my sons. And I, again, I, I mean, it's been like a, <clears throat> there's one of my sons, like nobody has seen him at the shelter over here. No one has seen him at, you know, where he used to work. I don't know if he got from New Hampshire to Colorado, right? I don't know where he is. And like this fear has gripped me, right? Especially at night. And I'm like praying for him. And then I'm like, God, forgive me for worrying too much. This has gotten a hold on me, which most things don't have a hold on me. But I'm just like, holy cow, what is going on here? You know, so... um you know, being free from that and giving it to God. God loves your kids more than you do. And just be like, okay, God, you're the one taking care of my family. I thought all this time it was me. You're the one who takes care of our family. So um, give it to God, whatever you're going through, ladies. And I will be starting 
focusing, focusing down. I mean, right now I'm just talking and I'm like, you know, da, 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 but I will be focusing in on specific things. Okay. Thanks for joining me guys.